This is Read Japanese Literature. My name is Allison Fincher. Read Japanese Literature is a podcast about Japanese fiction and some of its best works. All the works we discuss are available in translation, so you can read along if you want. And you can find out more at readjapaneseliterature.com. In this episode, Post Bubble Japan, the history of socially conscious Japanese literature, and Yu Miri's Tokyo Ueno Station. A powerful examination of Tokyo from the perspective of one of the most invisible people imaginable, the ghost of a homeless day laborer. As part of the story today, I want to tell you just a little bit more about myself, why I started Read Japanese Literature as a project, and why I started the Read Japanese Literature podcast in particular. I have a master's in English literature, and I spent almost a decade teaching high school English. In 2018, I had a kind of identity crisis. I found myself in need of a new direction in my life. I happened to be reading Haruki Murakami's Kafka on the Shore at the time. It was translated by Philip Gabriel. I liked Kafka enough that I grabbed the next Japanese title in translation I ran across. It was a pretty unconventional book, Mariko Ohara's Hybrid Child, translated by Jody Beck. The protagonist of Hybrid Child is a transgender robot. Most of the story takes place in a post apocalyptic world where a maternal AI threatens to destroy what's left of the human race. I should almost certainly do an episode about it sometime. But it was this obscure, bizarre work of Japanese speculative fiction that changed my life. It got me to think about gender, culture, capitalism, maybe even reality itself, in ways I'd never thought of before. And so I kept reading translated Japanese lit. Luckily, the local indie bookstore carried a great selection of translated books, and the public library system nearby had a strong interlibrary loan game. I started the website readjapaneseliterature.com in the spring of 2020 as a kind of pandemic passion project. It was and is a resource for people who want to read and enjoy Japanese fiction in English translation. And I've been podcasting since fall 2021. So, to summarize, a mostly random series of events came together at a moment I needed a new project to give a sense of purpose to my intellectual life. But this kind of intellectual work, using history, culture, context to really understand a story, has always been the thing I care about. It's what I did with my English language masters. It's what I did when I taught English. And that understanding really came home to me while I was preparing this episode. Here's why, and here's why I'm bringing this personal history up now. I read Yu Miri's Tokyo Ueno Station for the first time in 2020. I liked the book well enough, but I didn't think it was anything special. I'd been immersed in Japanese literature for about two years. I knew a reasonable amount about homelessness, at least in the US. I wasn't clueless about Japan. I'd spent time in Tokyo, I'd been to Ueno Park. But when I reread the novel to prepare for this episode, I realized again how much richer a story can be, how much richer it is when we know what sorts of experiences and ideas an author or original language reader might have had. And that's the kind of information I hope to fill my episodes with. In this episode, we'll take a look at the kinds of questions I wish I had answers to before I'd read Tokyo Ueno Station the first time. What does homelessness look like in Japan? Why did Miri feel compelled to take up homelessness as a theme in her novel? How have Japanese writers addressed social problems like homelessness in their writings in generations before Miri? Where does Miri fit in that tradition? 
what is the cultural significance of Miri's protagonist being from Fukushima? And why are the Olympics such a big deal in Tokyo Ueno Station? As I've mentioned before, World War II was a kind of artificial equalizer in Japan. By 1945, almost everyone's wealth had been destroyed. What hadn't been bombed or burned had been eaten up by inflation in the late 1940s. All kinds of long-standing hierarchies collapsed. And relative equality of opportunity made many Japanese people in the 1950s more hopeful about the future than they'd ever been before. But by the 1970s, it was becoming clear that even that brief shining moment of relative equality of opportunity had not led to equality of result. Before I get any farther, I should note that Japanese people approach economic inequality from a Japanese perspective. Post-war Japan has remained a relatively equal society from a global perspective. For example, in 2004, the Japanese were growing increasingly alarmed about the growth of economic inequality. At the time, the income of Japan's wealthiest 20% of people was only 2.3 times the income of its 20% of poorest people. Yes, this is an example of significant inequality. But in the U.S., the wealthiest people's income was 8 to 10 times more than the poorest. So please know as I continue that I, as an American, am not casting stones from the most fragile of glass houses. I am simply recognizing that economic inequality is a culturally important issue in Japan. And more importantly for us, it is something that Japanese literature increasingly addresses, whether directly or indirectly. Economic inequality only grew in the 1980s. One of the biggest contributors to rising inequality was the growth of non-regular employment. Again, non-regular employment is an issue in the United States as well, where we tend to use the term underemployment for the same sorts of ideas. In Japan, non-regular employment applies to people like contract workers and dispatch workers. Contract workers and dispatch workers are people with short-term assignments. They don't get the benefits or protections extended to full-time employees. These workers are an important group for our story today. When the recession hit in the early 90s, they were the first casualties. And we'll come back to them in a minute. Sometimes these kinds of workers are labeled with the slang term furita. In the 1980s, a furita was a young person with freedom. It was often a positive term. Lucky you, you don't have all of the obligations of a full-time employee. But since the 1980s, furita has become something of a slur. It implies somebody can't get a full-time job, and sometimes it's applied to somebody who might even be considered a burden on society. I should also note that non-regular employees were disproportionately marginalized groups. Women, for example, were often only able to get non-regular jobs. Employers made the sexist assumption that they'd marry and leave the workforce anyway. Why give them a full-time job? The Japanese economy floated through the late 1980s on an inflated real estate market. That bubble burst in 1990 when the real estate market crashed. By the end of the year, the stock market had deflated too. 1992 saw the beginning of a meaningful long-term recession Industrial production and construction fell off a cliff. The rest of the decade wasn't much better. The people of Japan found out how corrupt many of their politicians were. Japan's export economy collapsed. Its economic growth disappeared. Unemployment skyrocketed. Wages plummeted. And then the mid-90s saw a terrible earthquake in Kobe and then an act of terrorism just months later. Some people call the 1990s Japan's lost decade. That economic inequality we talked about just a few minutes ago, it accelerated. The phenomenon was marked enough to inspire new vocabulary. 
Japanese society was now a kakusa shakai, a stratified society, and many of its members were the nyurichi and the nyupua. I want to talk about three groups that really lost out in the recession, and there is definitely a lot of overlap between them. The first group is people with non-regular employment. We talked about them just a minute ago. From 1992 to 2012, the number of people in non-regular employment in Japan doubled. By 2012, almost 40% of wage earners had non-regular jobs. A lot of businesses like to hire non-regular employees. It means they can take on employees just when they need them without making long-term commitments to their well-being. Japanese business culture demands that companies try to retain full-time employees even when the company isn't doing well. But non-regular employment has other long-term consequences too. For example, male non-regular employees are only half as likely to be married as their non-regularly employed peers. The second group who really lost out are people who graduated from college in the 90s. Most Japanese companies tend to hire career track workers straight out of college. It's a system called the simultaneous recruiting of new graduates. In the 1990s, new grads who had prepped for careers for the first 20 years of their lives graduated with almost no prospects. Much like American millennials who graduated from college in the late aughts, some of these graduates have never made up for their career losses. The last group I want to talk about, the group most relevant for today, are Japan's homeless. First, I should clarify that homelessness is a complicated label. The definition of homelessness in Japan is pretty narrow. Since the passage of a new law in 2022, quote, the homeless are those who reside in facilities such as urban parks, riverbanks, roads, and railway stations for no valid reason and conduct their daily lives there. In other words, the only people regarded as homeless under Japanese law are people living rough. A lot of people became homeless when the bubble burst. It's a situation Yu Miri describes in pretty vivid detail in Tokyo Ueno Station. We'll talk about Miri and her book more later, but I want to read the sequence of events that she outlines right now. This is the life story the narrator hears from another homeless man. After university, I went to work at a real estate company. I got contract after contract for resort condos worth nearly a million yen a month. And I was on salary plus commission, so sometimes I was taking home 800000 a month. The average monthly Japanese salary in 2021, by the way, was 300000 yen. And I haven't done any adjusting for inflation. That means it's less than half of what this man was taking home in the late 80s. The man continues, But that took a turn. The bubble burst, and within three years, the company folded. I was loyal to my company. I kept saying, it's just a recession. It can't last that long. And that naivete is what did me in. I hit the bottom, splat. I look hard at the point when I lost control, but I still can't believe I became homeless. This man was university educated with a white collar job. During the economic recession in the 90s, day laborers were even more likely to lose their jobs and homes. And especially because day laborers were more likely to be from marginalized groups already, they easily slipped through the cracks of Japan's publicly funded social support networks. With nowhere to go, many of these newly homeless people set up rough shelters in Japan's public spaces, especially in cities like Tokyo. Here's another description from Tokyo Ueno Station. After the bubble burst, the population swelled and Ueno Park was so crowded with tar huts that you could no longer see the grass, only the paths and facilities like bathrooms and kiosks. Ueno Park is just a little north of central Tokyo. It's also the site of most of Tokyo's most important museums. In the late 90s and early aughts, private groups and public citizens started pushing for policy change. 
In 2002, the Diet passed the Special Act in regards to supporting the autonomy of the homeless population. And this act was supposed to help people who were sleeping rough to get the support they needed to find housing. This act was a huge public policy win. Homelessness, at least by the official Japanese definition, peaked in Japan in 2003. The number of people living on the streets in Japan has gone down considerably in the last 20 years. For the next few minutes, I want to talk about how social awareness has played out in modern literature, particularly in Japan. The earliest explicitly political fiction in modern Japanese literature included works supporting the creation of a democratic national assembly after the Meiji Restoration. The need for these kinds of works supporting a democratic national assembly ended when the Diet was founded in 1890. There were, of course, other works of fiction that addressed what we might consider political themes or social critique. A lot of these focused on the difference between social classes. Often the hero was a member of the middle or upper class with a romantic interest in a working or lower class woman. Some of the writing by Meiji women writers that we discussed in an earlier episode also has these kinds of elements of social criticism. We took a look at Ichiyo Higuchi and her best beloved story, Takekurabe. That's a story about two teens coming of age in one of Tokyo's pleasure quarters. The late 1910s and 1920s saw the rise of a new genre of socially aware literature worldwide, proletarian literature. The word proletariat comes from the Latin for the social class of people who owned little or no property. In Rome, it was just a term used in the census. Today, proletariat is most associated with the works of Karl Marx. As you probably know, he was the German man who wrote Das Kapital and co-wrote the Communist Manifesto. Marx used the term proletariat to describe the working class. Proletarian literature is literature written by people associated with communism or socialism who want to help the economic conditions of the working class. And as I mentioned in the 1920s and 30s, proletarian literature was truly a global movement. The Wikipedia entry has separate sections dedicated to Australia, France, Great Britain, Ireland, Japan, Korea, Romania, Russia, and then the USSR, Sweden, and the United States. And there was even an international meeting of proletarian writers held in the Soviet Union in 1924. In Japan, the story of proletarian literature more or less begins in 1920. That's the year the Nihon Shakai Shugi Dome was established, the Japan Socialist League. And the Japan Socialist League called for the creation of a proletarian literature movement. Ideally, Proletarian writers would come from both the working class and the intellectual class. As you might expect, many of the most enduring proletarian writers are actually college-educated. This is true not just in Japan, but in most of the world. And, for better or worse, a lot of proletarian literature turns out to be more political than literary. Several famous Japanese authors who were more or less sympathetic to socialism refused to write proletarian fiction. Osamu Dazai was an active Communist Party member for a short while. About proletarian fiction, he wrote, quote, Whenever I am brought face to face with an unnatural, ugly style, I always get goose flesh and the corners of my eyes become hot for no accountable reason. Proletarian literature fell out of fashion abruptly in Japan in the 1930s, It wasn't really until the 1950s and 60s that left-wing politics came back into play in Japanese fiction. Some of the biggest political questions that came up in novels in the 50s and 60s are questions left in the wake of World War II. What is the continuing role of Japanese tradition, especially the imperial institution? How does Japan deal with its wartime responsibility? And how does Japan move forward in a world with nuclear weapons? 
That includes dealing with the aftermath of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A lot of more recent Japanese novels, stories from the 1980s through today, take up what you might call more everyday political concerns or maybe more domestic political concerns. I like to describe these novels as quietly political. And this quiet politics is one of the things that I personally like best about Japanese fiction. To see a quiet politics in a novel is really to do what's called a Marxist reading, to read a book through the lens of Marxist literary theory. Now, Marxist literary theory shares some underlying principles with Marxism, but it isn't really the same thing. You don't have to be a Marxist or a socialist or a communist to see the value in Marxist literary theory. Let me explain just a little. Before World War II, many readers and critics interested in Marxist literary theory were more interested in the politics of leftist writing than the writing itself. This is the kind of writing that Osamu Dazai criticized that made his eyes burn and gave him goosebumps. For example, someone might talk about convenience store woman solely as the story of a working class woman in a low paid, undervalued part time job, as though that is the extent of what is valuable or important in the story. Especially after World War II, Marxist criticism adopted some of the methods of other contemporary schools of literary theory. It's come to be a way to read a story in its special historical moment. The British literary critic Terry Eagleton wrote a famous study, Marxism and Literary Criticism, in 1976. In that book, he explained that the aim of Marxist criticism is to, quote, explain the literary work more fully. And this means a sensitive attention to its forms, styles, and meanings. But it also means grasping those forms, styles, and meanings as the product of a particular history. Before we move on to Tokyo Ueno Station, I'll mention three popular and award-winning Japanese titles published in the last two decades or so that prominently feature people on the margins of Japanese society. These are three books with that kind of quiet politics, three books that really reward a Marxist reading. And these are three books I picked because I happen to particularly enjoy them. I can easily think of a half dozen more, In fact, I think I'm going to tweet a few ideas in the next week or so. You'll notice that none of the books I'm going to mention are proletarian fiction. None of them are about the character's social conditions at all. There's just an awareness of what society looks like for the have-nots. The first book I'd like to mention is Out by Kirino Natsuo. Out was published in Japan in 1997. It won the Mystery Writers of Japan Award that year. It was translated into English by Stephen Snyder in 2004. It's a perennial favorite among people who like Japanese literature, especially crime fiction. I should probably mention as a content warning for the book, it's very graphic. Its heroines are four women who work the graveyard shift at a bento factory. So again, these heroines are on the margins. They're women and they're people who circumstances force into non-regular employment. Now, it turns out that being a housewife with food prep skills and sharp knives is great training for a life in crime. The main plot of the novel involves these women taking up work, moonlighting, disposing of murdered corpses. It's a gruesome book, but it's also a book about the quiet desperation of these women. The second book, Maki Kashimata's novella, Touring the Land of the Dead, won the Akutagawa Prize in 2012. It was translated into English by Hayden Trowell in 2021. The protagonist's name is Natsuko. Her history is tied to a once prosperous spa resort. Natsuko's very wealthy and important grandfather took his family there when Natsuko's mother was a child. And her mother took Natsuko there when Natsuko was very young. Now, for a third generation, Natsuko has returned. These days, the resort is falling apart. Touring the Land of the Dead is a rich novella, but it also works well as a simple allegory. Natsuko's mother will never be wealthy again, 
but she can't let the past go. Like policymakers in the 1990s, like some older Japanese people, she clings to the idea that an economic miracle is coming back. If her mother represents people who long for the return of Japan as number one, then Natsuko represents the younger generation looking for a way to live happily in an era of economic stagnation. And finally, the third book I'd like to mention is Kikuo Sumura's novel, There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job. It was published in Japan in 2015. It was translated into English by Polly Barton and published in English in 2020. The narrator had to quit a job she loves because of what she terms burnout syndrome. But every job she tries instead carries its own critique of late-stage capitalism. In one job, she's stuck watching another person's life on a hidden camera. She finds that it fuels her consumerist desires to watch him go shopping. In another, she tries to prevent the city government from closing down an unprofitable bus line. After all, it only serves housewives, children, and elderly people. Why leave it open? In another job, she helps deal with litter that blows into a national park from a nearby sports stadium. This darkly comic novel is one of my favorite books ever. Highly recommended. Yumiri was born in 1968. She grew up in Yokohama. Miri is Zainichi Korean. That means she is the descendant of Korean people who came to Japan before the end of World War II. Her father was the son of Korean immigrants to Japan. He worked in a pachinko parlor. Pachinko is a gambling arcade game, something like a slot machine. One pachinko historian at Tufts University estimated that Koreans own 80% of Japan's pachinko parlors. Miri's mother was a refugee from the Korean War. She worked as a hostess. There isn't really an English language equivalent of a hostess. It's a woman who serves drinks and keeps men company at a bar. They're not sex workers. Most hostess clubs have a no-touching policy, although they aren't necessarily as well enforced as perhaps they ought to be. Miri's father was abusive. Her parents divorced when she was very young. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Miri's Zainichi identity. And that's because Miri doesn't make it a big part of her public persona. Being ethnically Korean in Japan is hugely complex. So complex, in fact, that even though Miri has always lived in Japan, even though her father has always lived in Japan, even though Miri speaks almost no Korean, she's a citizen of South Korea instead of Japan. I'm planning to do an entire episode about Zainichi people and literature later this season. It's not that Miri denies her heritage, but it also hasn't been a big part of her writing or the way she publicly identifies. Her novel, The Ends of August, is a notable exception. It's a highly fictionalized version of her grandfather's life under the Japanese occupation of Korea. It has been translated into English by Morgan Giles, and it's set for publication in August of 2023. Miri's de-emphasis on her ethnic identity is somewhat unusual for Zainichi literature, by the way. Then again, Miri has been described as, quote, probably the first Zainichi Korean author to have achieved critical recognition, phenomenal popularity, and even a celebrity of sorts. She's also been called the first Zainichi author that can be regarded as a trendsetter influencing mainstream Japanese society. And apparently her 1998 novel Gold Rush was the first full-length work of fiction by a Zainichi Korean author to appear in English. That seems somewhat unbelievable, but it also seems true. It was published in translation by Stephen Snyder in 2002. So maybe it's fairer to say that Miri is reshaping what it means to be a Zainichi author. Choosing to focus on different aspects of her identity has not saved Miri from encountering racism. Some bookstores have still chosen to cancel events due to racially motivated bomb threats. Miri didn't enjoy school. She was bullied, especially because she was Zainichi. She dropped out of high school. She joined a theater troupe as an actress and an assistant director. She published her first play when she was just in her early 20s, and then her first novel only a few years later. 
Her novel, Family Cinema, won the Akutagawa Prize when she was 29. Today, Yumiri is a celebrity. She has actually described herself as living, quote, life on stage. She is well known in Japan as a playwright and author. One of her novels resulted in a highly publicized privacy lawsuit. A model for one of the characters objected to the way she was portrayed in the story. Miri also wrote a famous, or maybe infamous, series of memoirs about an affair with a married Japanese man. Miri is also famous as an activist. Translator Allison Markin Powell has described her as an author who shines light, quote, on certain overlooked aspects of contemporary Japanese society, raising issues that some would prefer to ignore. She has become an especially vocal advocate for the victims of the March 2011 triple disasters, the 9.0 magnitude earthquake, 133-foot tsunami, and nuclear reactor meltdown. I want to do an episode later about 311 and the rich body of Fukushima fiction that followed. But in the meantime, I'll summarize. By an official 2021 count, almost 20,000 people died. Another 2,500 are missing and presumed dead. The World Bank has placed economic losses at 235 billion American dollars, making it the most expensive disaster in history. After the disaster, Miri traveled to the affected area frequently. Fukushima was the site of the nuclear meltdown, but that doesn't mean it was the only area affected. There was a broad region affected by the earthquake, tsunami, and by the radioactive fallout. Tohoku is not only the site of Fukushima, but it's also an historically overlooked part of Japan in the northeast of the main island of Honshu. The GDP per capita in Tohoku is below the average GDP per capita for the whole of Japan and less than half the average GDP per capita in Tokyo. Just traveling to Tohoku after 311 was a huge sign of support. Many people in Tohoku felt abandoned by the rest of Japan, especially the government, and there was a lot of fear around anything that came out of Tohoku, that perhaps it was contaminated, perhaps the radiation was going to damage the rest of Japan and its people. In 2015, Miri even moved to Fukushima, and in 2018, she opened a bookstore and theater there. She's really invested almost a decade of her life in Tohoku, its people, and its recovery. That support of Tohoku fits with the broader patterns of Miri's life and her career. Remember that Allison Markin Powell described her interest in certain overlooked aspects of contemporary Japanese society. Many people think of Tohoku as a region continually exploited by Tokyo, its neighbor to the south. This is a very common global problem that the bigger a city gets, the more exploited, less developed areas outside of the city perceive themselves to be and very often actually are. For example, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant that melted down after the 311 disaster didn't supply power to anyone in Fukushima. It was owned and operated by the Tokyo Electric Power Company to provide power to people living in Tokyo. During the economic miracle, the high growth period of the 1960s, a lot of laborers from Tohoku went to Tokyo to find jobs. This process of laborers coming from Tohoku and other poorer regions to Tokyo repeated itself for the 2020 Olympics. In the 2010s, economic circumstances forced these laborers to leave behind unfinished rebuilding projects from 311. That means the Olympics directly undermined reconstruction. So how does all of this contribute to our understanding of Tokyo Ueno Station? Yumiri tells a story about an encounter she had in the late 1990s. And I'm going to quote directly from her. I heard that there was this enforced removal of people that happened in Ueno Park. 
Ueno Park in Tokyo is where there are a lot of famous museums, but I'd heard that when the imperial family visited for the opening ceremony of a new exhibition in Ueno Park, there was a special cleaning that happened that got rid of the homeless people living in the park for that imperial visit. She had also heard that many of the homeless living in Ueno Park were from the Tohoku region. She wondered whether that was really true. It was. Historically speaking, Ueno Park had been a kind of gateway to Tohoku. Ueno Station was where visitors and laborers would first arrive from Tohoku. Through her investigations, Miri became very invested in the stories of these people, almost all of them men, and she began spending time with and interviewing them in order to prepare to write Tokyo Ueno Station. You don't have to read more than a few paragraphs of Tokyo Ueno Station to find out that there is something very different about the narrator. He's dead. There was never a time I was not tired, he says, not when life had its claws in me and not when I escaped from it. The more you learn about the narrator's life, the more you realize he never really lived it at all. He tells the reader, by the time I was old enough to understand the world around me, the war had begun and food shortages meant my stomach was always empty. He was 12 when World War II ended and he was desperate to feed seven brothers and sisters, all of them younger than him. Providing for them meant he had to leave his home and look for work elsewhere, first in another town as a fisherman, then on the far northern Japanese island of Hokkaido, and then eventually in Tokyo. He arrived in Tokyo just before New Year's in 1963 to help the city prepare for the 1964 Olympics. He marries young, but his family grows up without him. He has a son and a daughter who barely know him. He only visits briefly each year. His son dies an untimely death when the narrator is away in Tokyo. His son's death has many implications. One of them means that he won't have anyone to care for him in his old age. The narrator eventually realizes, I think if one were to count all the days I had spent with my wife after 37 years of marriage, they would not even add up to a year. Later, when the narrator no longer has responsibilities for anyone else, he decides to leave Tohoku for good. He takes the same train journey he's taken his whole life, the same journey day laborers have taken from Tohoku for decades, and arrives at Ueno Station. And that night is the first night he spends sleeping rough. The narrative style of Tokyo Ueno Station is stream of consciousness, a kind of rough depiction of the way the narrator thinks and remembers. It's the kind of book you have to pay close attention to, not beach reading. If your mind wanders for a paragraph, you might find yourself 40 years in the past without knowing why. And it isn't always clear what parts of the story the narrator is remembering, what parts of the story he lived, and which parts he passively observes as a ghost. The English language translator Morgan Giles has explained that half of the time you're not sure if he's overhearing these conversations because he's homeless and nobody notices that he's there or because he's dead and he's haunting this park. The way the story's told really reinforces the idea that homeless people are invisible even when they're alive. They just get overlooked. Conscious narrative style works really well for at least one of the things Miri is trying to do in her book. She is drawing important parallels between the different moments in the narrator's life and in the history of Japan. The narrator was born in 1933, just like Emperor Akihito. Emperor Akihito was Hirohito's son. His reign, the Heisei period, lasted from 1989 to 2019. The narrator's son, Koichi, was born on the same day as Akihito's son, the imperial prince. The narrator's time in Tokyo is also bracketed by Tokyo's two Olympic Games in 1964 and 2020. Well, the games were scheduled for 2020 when the book was written and published, and translated for that matter. 
As you probably know, the 2020 Olympics were rescheduled for 2021 because of the COVID-19 pandemic and ended up being held with a lot of controversy associated with them. For Tokyoites and for many people in Japan, at least before the outbreak of COVID-19, the games were a symbol of hope and recovery. For people in Tohoku, they were a mixed blessing. They provided work on the one hand, but they also took men away from their families and they took workers away from rebuilding. And in Tokyo Ueno Station, the Olympics are one of the major forces displacing the homeless. One morning, the narrator finds a new sign in Ueno Park. Japan needs the power of dreams now more than ever. Bring the 2020 Olympics and Paralympics to Japan. Obviously, the Olympics won't be granting any of his dreams. Miri even presents parallels between the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake and the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake. The 1923 earthquake cost more than 100,000 lives. After the disaster, people crowded into Ueno Park searching for safety. What is the point of all this parallelism? These same generational curses haunt the people on Japan's margins over and over and over again. I've been using a lot of information today from a Japan Foundation of New York talk with you, Miri and Morgan Giles. As always, you can find a link on the podcast episode page. In that talk, Miri said that the hinge between all the people she covers in this book is their pain. The narrator stands in as a representative of so many marginalized people. He's a day laborer. He's from Tohoku. He's homeless. And so he is trapped in this cycle even after he has died. Time has ended, he says, but that time is scattered here and there like spilled pushpins. As I am unable to take my eyes away from that glance at sadness All I can do is suffer. Time does not pass. Time never ends. So why read Tokyo Ueno Station? First, I hope this episode has given you some context to make the experience of reading it just a little bit richer. As you may have noticed or guessed, Tokyo Ueno Station is not a cheerful book. And it's not an easy read, but it is a great book for deepening a reader's understanding, their understanding of Japan, their understanding of other people, and their understanding of themselves. It is a good book, one I've obviously found it worthwhile to come back to. It's a well-translated book, really beautiful to read, and it is an important book by a culturally important writer. Today, I've been reading from Morgan Giles' translation. You can find links to purchase that book, as well as links to a bibliography and resources at readjapaneseliterature.com. Buy your books through our link to bookshop.org to support the podcast. You can also support the podcast in other ways. Leave a review on your podcast app of choice, and you can become a supporter through Patreon, patreon.com slash readjapaneseliterature. Next time, a two-part story, one part legendary Kron Yokai, the Yamauba, one part groundbreaking trans-Pacific feminist author Mina Kaoba, coming together in the magnificent short story Smile of the Mountain Witch. We'd love to hear from you about the podcast. You can always tweet us at at readjapaneselit or use the contact page at readjapaneselit.com. Thank you to the Japanese Literature Twitter community, the Japanese Literature Group on Goodreads, and the Japanese Literature Group on Facebook. Thank you as always to producer Kaim for today's music at Kaim Music and KaimMusic.com. <laughs>